I think the mother's name in this comic strip is Wanda, I think. But I, I'll call her Wanda. And the little girl comes in, Mom, I need a new backpack. And she's dragging her backpack. She says, well, that one's practically new. I know, but it's not the same kind that the other girls have. And she looks so mournful. Zoe, if you follow the crowd, you'll just be like everyone else. <laughs> so she grabs her mother by the knees and says, I knew you'd understand. <laughs> if my one aim in life is to follow the crowd, what kind of people will gather at my grave and say, well done? Over on the left, is a strip that was drawn after Tommy Hart passed away. And he was a cartoonist that drew these different characters. And it's as though all those characters could assemble at his grave. And one of them says, well done. Johnny Hart dared to make fun of the so-called evolutionary development. And he honored God in his comics. And the question is, do I honor God in my life? No matter what it is, do I honor God in my life? Let's read Matthew 25, 23 together. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Enter into your reward. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Let's read that. Enter through the narrow gate, because the gate and road that leads to destruction are wide. Many enter through the wide gate, but the narrow gate and the road that leads to life are full of difficulty. Only a few people find the narrow gate. In the old King James it said straight gate and all I knew was like the Straits of Gibraltar and I didn't know it's like people used to say I'm in a tight strait or I'm in, you know I'm having trouble I can't figure out where to go and that's the sense here Christians have difficulty because we can't just go with the crowd we have to make decisions of what's right and we're going to do that and sometimes it's difficulties for different reasons that way. I have 48 that's on the board there. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. God made a promise about that. Let's read these two verses here together. Matthew 24, 35 and 1 Peter 1, 25. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. So God promised that his word was going to stand forever. Well, most people trust what's called the providence of God. Most Christians believe in the providence of God. And I, just for an example, when T.G. was alive, uh, Jermaine's husband, he was in his work van, and he was over here where Tampa Bay Mall used to be, and it's a big median down the middle. Heavy traffic. And he's in the inside lane going that way, and and all of a sudden, who knows why, they'll never know because the person died, a car coming this way, sharply accelerated, jumped to the median, sheared the right front of his truck off, just took it with him, and hit the driver on T.G.'s right, and both the driver of the oncoming car and on the T.G.'s right were both killed. And T.G. said, God was with me that time. Wow. Wouldn't that thought have occurred to you? Would, should I have argued with him? And we think of that as the providence of God because in, in our prayers we pray for safety and, you know, 
And when the providence of God is the word we use to describe God's action that way. Would he have the Bible written and then not preserve it for us? He's preserved the world to this day. And he's preserved his word to this day. Now, what we're going to talk is how mankind is, you might say, manipulated a little bit by God in unseen ways to carry out God's wishes. For instance, and I know some of this is just, I believe the rest of this page is just me reading, but you look at it. The scribes who hand copied the law made what they called the hedge around the law. Exact copies of each page were made. They always made them the same way. And then they wrote notes all the way around the page. It said how many letters were on each line? And how many words were on each line? And what was the mental word? And then notes explaining any unusual thing that was written about on that page. Each and every page was that way. And it was checked and checked and rechecked before anybody said, okay, this is a good copy. That's pretty thorough. <laughs> when I had to do papers in school, I'll confess, I was never anywhere near that thorough. Early manuscripts, uh, and just by the by, some people don't know. I, I went to USF and I had professors who were atheists, didn't believe in God at all, but boy, they believed in Plato. You had to take these classes in Plato. And they quoted Plato up, and they quoted Plato down, and then Plato said this, Plato said, between the time Plato lived and the very first copy of his manuscript, any manuscript claiming to be paid was 1,500 years. They never mentioned that. The Sinaiticus here, in the middle of this page, was made from an original writing of the apostles and things. See, it was made from the original manuscripts around 330 AD. The Vaticanus or, was of 340 AD. You know, that's 1,800 years closer to the Bible events, 1,800 years closer to the time of Christ than we are, and you've got people today that say they know more about it than these people knew. The Alexandrinus was written about 425 AD, and there are many ancient partial manuscripts of texts. Like if you've ever been looking through an old drawer and a book torn up and there was a page or two of it, that kind of thing. Valid manuscripts are what's counted by those that study that, do have minor differences. But none involve teachings about how to be saved. None involve teachings about how to worship God or how to live as a Christian so as to please God. Of course, any of those manuscripts that have the story of what happened at Pentecost tell the same thing about what Peter said, the same thing about what was happening, and the same thing about the people asking, and the same, you know, all the events the same. The differences are so minor that most Bible scholars who are into all of that stuff consider them to be irrelevant. You know, Maybe one would call it a structure and another would call it a building. You know. What? You know? Translations. Now, these manuscripts are copies in the original languages. Translations are from one language to another. Before the time of Christ, 130 years before Christ, they finished copying the old Hebrew Bible into Greek, the common Greek that was spoken. They called it the Septuagint. And as a matter of fact, Jesus quoted from it, which is kind of like saying, that's okay. 
In the fourth century, they translated the Bible into Gothic and Vulgate, the Latin. In the fifth century, into Armenian, Syriac, which is Iraq and part of India, Coptic, Nubian, Ethiopian, Georgian, uh, Georgia, Russia. In the sixth century, into German. In the ninth century, into the Slavic languages and into some early English languages. You know, these parts of it. Look at all this for information. Page two. Then the Catholic Church began to assume power in Europe, and they took the position that common people were not qualified to read or think about the Bible. And so they placed the Bibles in the hands of the priesthood and charged them with teaching the people whatever they needed to know. There was a lot of conflict about that. There were horrors and atrocities both on the part of the Catholic Church and the Inquisitions and on the part of all non-Catholics, uh, murders and horrible, horrible things, which maybe just proves people get really upset about religion. Now, a few words about the Bible into English and other languages. A man named John Wycliffe translated God's truth into English from the original Hebrew and Greek, from manuscripts, you see, in 1380. This was against the wishes of the Catholic Church, and so much so that he had to go to another country to do it. In the late 1500s, with the coming of King Henry VIII, who got, said we can't be Catholic anymore because I want a divorce, and he started the Church of England, they switched over their services to English. Wycliffe's translation in one form or another was modified by other scholars until King James came to reign in the early 1600s. And he authorized an English translation originally with the idea that this would be something that everybody who could afford one could read and own. He tried to change his idea about the time the thing came out, but still. It came out, that's what's called the original King James language. If you tried to read it, you couldn't. They made their fees like this and a whole lot of other things. It's been revised a whole lot of times to where it looked like our language, you see. That was always the intent of it, to have the Bible be so that man could access the Word of God. There's a new King James, the few Bibles we have here are diligently compared and revised with the original King James. I was going to guess and I would have got it wrong. The first translation into Thai, is I saying it right? Yes. Okay. Was in 1834. Known, I should say, doesn't mean you know. The whole Bible is in 670 languages. The New Testament alone is in 1,521 languages and subgroup languages. This whole effort was in hopes of preserving and sharing God's holy truth that people might receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Thousands and thousands of faithful, diligent people have been involved in preserving God's Word. That's the providence of God preserving His Word. You, you, know, you and I can go into a Bible bookstore today and ask, where do you keep the Bibles? And <laughs> this little brat. <laughs> They're Bibles. Everything else is all the books that people wrote. Buy one of those Bibles and you know what you're going to get? You're going to get the Word of God. The truth of God. Preserved by the providence of God so that you and I can read it and learn how to live, to please God, how to be saved. But some try to change Bible truth. Let's read Deuteronomy 4 2 together. You shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep 
the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now that's back from the Old Testament as it was being written. <laughs> it's real clear. It. Don't mess with it in order that you can do what it says. And in Revelation 22, that's the place where it says if you add to it, I'll add, God will add the plagues of this book on you. And if it, you take away from it, God will take your name out of the book of life. But, it's people that don't care about that. They just want the Bible to say what they want it to say. One way is by blatantly changing the wording to support special ideas. It's what's called the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. And if they didn't like the way something was written, they just changed it. There's the Book of Mormon. They believe in modern day inspiration, so they get this fantastic book about Jesus over here with the American Indians and all kind of things happening. I tried to read it one time and I couldn't. I, I, not because it wasn't in English, it was just so boring and I couldn't, you know. And I know people say that about I wrote this. <laughs> the Ethiopian Bible. Study it a little bit better. They have 82 books. We Protestants have 66. Well, theirs doesn't just include what's called the Apocrypha, which we'll get to in a minute. It includes a few books about cultural and historical things like they believe that uh, the Queen of Sheba brought the Ark of the Covenant back with it and stuff like that, which is not supported by the Bible at all, by the way, if you've seen that special, those specials, because the, the Ark of the Covenant was still incorrectly being carried around on the shoulders of priests in Jerusalem, according to the Bible, in the time of Josiah the king, shortly before the Babylonian captivity. So if you can believe the Bible, you can't believe the Ethiopian versions. And there are additions eliminating various sins. You know, your favorite sin and you don't want to give it up, just take it out. Page three. Another method is by twisting the meaning of God's Word. In 2 Peter, Paul wrote about the things that Paul had written about, and he said this. Let's read that together. Some things are to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. Just picture, here's a guy, and he's down on the ground, and he's got a Bible, and he's wrestling with it, like Jacob wrestled with an angel. And he just twisted, and he twisted, I don't know, now read it. They do that with the words. When I was in college, a guy I worked with claimed that Onan, now I haven't even read about Onan, he cast his seed on the ground. He was supposed to raise up children to his brother's wife. That was an Old Testament law. And instead he cast his sin on the ground, his seed on the ground. It's called the sin of Onan. So this guy said, well that proves it's better to use a whore. <laughs> well, you've got to get that thing in a headlock and almost break the head off to get that out of the sin of Onan. You can read about that if you like in Genesis chapter 38. Another method is by overriding the truth. Uh, trucks used to have uh, a governor on them, a little device. It would not allow the truck to go past a certain speed. Uh, they kept Volkswagen engines from breaking by always setting the carburetor wouldn't, where it wouldn't open all the way. Mm -hmm. And my brother got wise to that, so <laughs> he opened, fixed it so the carburetor would, he broke the motor and, and the shafts and everything in two different Volkswagens. <laughs> in other words, he took the governor, the control off of it. Well, some people put a governor on it, and that's all that's important. One of them, for instance, is, well, as long as you try to do right, 
I think it's lungs or persons trying to live right. And then he made and, and anybody that was a scholar and knew anything looked at it and it was faulty logic and it was ridiculous, but people just loved it because it meant there couldn't be a God scene. Oh. Well, those kind of people, if it starts getting warm, they got their reserved questions like, what about those savages that never, and if you, you can't give them an answer, of course there's no answer that they want, then, then if they don't have to, I don't have to. They misdirected, always away from themselves. Another thing that people do is to just flat undermine the Bible. In the last few years, there's been a lot of junk come up, TV specials too, about the Gospel of Judas. And they said, just discovered. That's a stupid lie. The Gospel of Judas, so-called, was written about 100 A.D. What do you mean, just discovered? They've known about it three-fourths of forever. And it was written by disgruntled scribes who wanted to subversively, underhandedly, get people not to believe in the Bible. So they claimed that Judas was a good guy and that Jesus had come up to him and said, you're so faithful, I'm going to ask you to be the one that betrays me. And so he did that. He was just misunderstood. Well, if that's the truth, then the rest of the Bible's a lie, isn't it? See? And there's many, many efforts to undermine Bible truths of that nature. The reason we don't hear about them is because people thought about them and discarded them ages ago. Except, except, except for things like the Ethiopian Bible. Somebody's always writing another one, trying to add what they want to. Now, God's inspired writing, writers tell the certainty. Uh, Luke 1, 1 through 4, let's read that together. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty of those things wherein you have been instructed. Most people get lost in all of that. But here's how simple it is. Chris, if you had been alive at the time of Christ, and you saw him crucified, and you saw the blood came out, and all of your experience, the man that's dead, and then you saw him walking around through the city, and you saw dead people that you knew were dead, up walking around through the city, and you could read, Right, wouldn't you have written something? The probability is every last person in Jerusalem who could read and write wrote a letter to grandmother or wrote in their letter or just, you know. Many, Luke said, many have written about the things that happened that are believed among us. But you see, that didn't make what they wrote Bible, did it? Because most of them were inspired of God. Even if you write the truth. If you write the truth to a relative because you're concerned about their soul, if you get on the internet and you give somebody an answer that's biblically based and completely true, your answer is not the Bible. Because the Bible was written by people especially appointed by God who was inspired and who, like Luke said here, having had perfect understanding because God inspired him. <coughs> and he says, now you're going to know the certain because you and I know that some of those people who wrote what had happened in those days 
made mistakes, didn't they? Some of them didn't see the right thing or they misinterpreted what they saw. Now, Luke says, when you read what I'm writing, you'll know here's the way it went down. In other words, we can entrust our souls to the messages from the inspired writers. Page four. More about the idea that not all writings with scripture in it are Bibles. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 and more in 1948. They were written by an uninspired Jewish cult. Some real oddballs called Essenes. The scrolls include their own ideas. I'm going to mispronounce this, so get ready for it. For asceticism and celibacy. For living like hermits and not getting married or having any children. Things about their daily affairs. How many bags of flour they had on. That's all it. I bet you can do anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls. You didn't know stuff like that was in them. They weren't just Bibles. They were writings about all their stuff of their cult. But there were writings about the Bible in them, sealed in these clay jars and preserved. That's why to me it would be incorrect to use the scrolls of the Essenes as a source book for the Bible and change what's always been believed because of something they said. My wife Marilyn has a handwritten sermon outline that her father made very many years ago. It referred to many scriptures. But the outline itself is not a Bible, is it? It's a sermon outline. They're not the same. No matter how true it is, it's not a Bible. So how did they determine Holy Scripture? The Old Testament books were completed hundreds of years before Christ. Jesus authorized them by quoting from them. The reading that George made before, before we started the lesson, Jesus stood up in the synagogue and he opened one of their scrolls and he read from the book of Isaiah the prophecy about himself and he said, this day is this prophecy fulfilled in your ears, your eyes. Ah, uh, that's pretty. He like he put his stamp on it and said, "This is scripture." And they they had the completed Old Testament for hundreds of years before Christ was born, and people inspiration was still accurate. So all these apocryphal books about Old Testament things you see, uh, other writings were were disclaimed as scripture by inspired people back in the Old Testament days. They knew it's not Scripture, see. The Jews, if you would, used the same 39 books that you and I use. That's why we use them. New Testament letters were circulated. Let's read Colossians 4.16. And when this letter is read among you, Cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the letter from Laodicea. If we didn't have Bibles and inspiration is active, Paul sent us a letter, and he sent a letter to the church. Is it 34th Street? Do I have the right street where your mom goes? 29. 29. 29th. 29th Street. And then Paul said, look, I want you to take your copy, my letter, and take it over to 29th Street and have them read it. And I want 29th Street. What I want them, I want you to read it. That way he didn't have to write one letter to... <laughs> but don't you imagine we would have said, listen, get to 20. Do you mind if we get a copy of the letter Paul wrote to you? Think? And they would say, well, no, and let, let's get a copy of yours. And they kept circulating it around. And they met together at other times, but 
and I think it was around 200 that first came up with the idea of let's get most some people from the different churches to bring a list of what they have and compare notes to we want to make sure we have it all. It's been going on a long time. By 397 AD, they had a group that met together with delegates from far and wide, and they said, look, there's 39 Old Testament books, there's 27 New Testament books, that's inspired scripture, and everything else is not inspired scripture. That's how long we've been using the Bible as we know it, see? It's simple to get a Bible. It's God's Word to mankind. It's the Word of God in truth. It's not the arguments of this modern world, Sadducees and Pharisees. If you think about people that have argued to you, like the lady that came down on you, and people like that, see if you don't recognize a little bit in this scripture that, that, that George is going to read here on the back of this uh, Man challenged Jesus, the Son of God. This began. Then the Pharisees went away and planned to trap Jesus into saying the wrong thing. They sent their disciples to him along with Herod's followers. They said to him, Teacher, we know that you tell the truth and that you teach the truth about the way of God. You don't favor individuals because of who they are. So tell us what you think. Is it right to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Jesus recognized their evil plan, so he asked, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin used to pay taxes. They brought him a coin. He said to them, whose face and name is this? They replied, the emperor's. Then he said to them, very well, give the emperor what belongs to the emperor, and give God what belongs to God. They were surprised to hear this. They left him alone and went away. On that day, some Sadducees, who say that people will never come back to life, came to Jesus. They asked him, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies childless, his brother should marry his widow and have children for his brother. There were seven brothers among us. The first married and died. Since he had no children, he left his widow to his brother. The second brother also died, as well as the third, and the rest of the seven brothers. At the last, the woman died. Now when the dead come back to life, whose wife will she be? All seven brothers have been married to her. Jesus answered, You're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures or God's power. When people come back to life, they don't marry. Rather, they are like the angels in heaven. Haven't you read what God told you about the dead coming back to life? He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. He amazed the crowds who heard his teaching. And you notice he, he didn't, doesn't say he amazed, he suggests, but it doesn't say he amazed the Pharisees and Sadducees. See, so there's lots of people whose joy in life is to argue make up all kind of stuff to put people on there. can't do anything except look at the truth and say that's the truth that I need to meet its standards. So this is a little background into why we can trust the Word of God. His providence he's seen to it and to this day in 1500 languages you can 
get a Bible and read the story of Jesus Christ and the gospel that's able to save our souls. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we're going to stand together and sing number 35. We'd ask that you may be known while we do that. Peter at Pentecost preached with power to the sinners who crucified Christ. He is risen now, he's in heaven to pay your redemption price. The Holy Spirit has come down, miracles are all around. Peter at Pentecost preached with power to the sinners who crucified Christ. Hallelujah, let us sing, Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Send the gospel word to all, even as many as the Lord shall call. Peter at Pentecost preached with power, and the people cried, What can we do? Change your evil ways, be baptized today, forgiveness will come to you. The gift of the Spirit is to all, even as many as the Lord shall call. Peter at Pentecost preached with power, and the people cried, What can we do? Hallelujah, let us sing, Jesus Christ is Lord and King, send the gospel word to all, even as many as the Lord shall call. Peter at Pentecost preached with power, and the gospel still calls us today. Everyone who hears millions through the years to follow the living way. The miracles that day are past, but the blood of Jesus lasts. Peter at Pentecost preached with power, and the gospel still calls us today. Hallelujah, let us sing. Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Send the gospel word to all, even as many as the Lord shall call. In the front of our green books is the Lord's Prayer. Let's say that together and then we'll We'll ask Kurt to lead us in a closing prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father, we're thankful that we pray to gather together this morning to sing songs of praise to you, to learn another portion of your truth, your word. We pray that we can keep today's lesson in our hearts, in our minds, and in our actions as we show others how to live as Christians. We pray that you those who could not be with us today, that they could be made healthy again uh, or return from their trips to join us again. We pray uh, that your forgiveness will stay with us and that you will keep us safely in our care until we meet again. In Christ's name.